York office studio, um, and we'll be here in New York all week. And there will be a number of different uh, TV appearances and, and interviews. There's also just a lot of client meetings and portfolio things and speaking engagements going on. It's a pretty, pretty massively busy week. In fact, um, I'm going to have Trevor Cummings uh, do the DC Today. I Actually, I think it's Brian Seitel doing it tomorrow, Tuesday. Trevor Cummings doing it on Thursday. I'll be with you on Wednesday. And then we're going to have a uh, the normal Dividend Cafe that I'll record from here in New York on Friday. Speaking of the Dividend Cafe, if you missed it from the Friday before, particularly the video, for those of you who like watching video, um, we did add all of the charts uh, as I was talking to the different things I was going through. And I'd encourage you to check that out if the subject of housing is important to you. So let's talk about the market today, and then we'll kind of cover a few more evergreen things that may be on your mind. Um, and actually, even apart from evergreen, there are some things in the news cycle and um, uh, it, with the Fed I'm going to go through. The one thing I'd like to just give you a quick kind of bullet point on, and maybe this will keep you tuned in, is I just thought it would be helpful to give my kind of sequence of events and the really underlying political calculus in this debt ceiling debate. A lot of asked, and we answered last week, I think in two different Q&As or asked David section about how we're approaching the risk of a debt default and this and that. And hopefully those answers made sense. And I even last week told uh, listeners my opinion on the whole matter, just you know, laying out kind of what I thought were, were some of the, the um, political and even ideological takes that were relevant to it. But, but today I want to give you just kind of a breakdown as to how I see this thing shaking out. I think it'd be worth your, your time. So in terms of the market today, the Dow ended up being up 254 points. It was off of its highs. Um, it did actually at one point uh, get up over 300 but, you know, the futures were kind of flattish last night and, and flat, uh, they were up um, a bit this morning, but then um, moved higher after the market opened and then kind of zigged and zagged through the last three quarters of the day. Um, but, you know, stayed up and, and that's just the Dow, which was up, you know, three quarters of a percentage point. The S&P was up over 1%, the NASDAQ up 2%. So you had a strong day in technology. And, and again, strong upside um, in markets. The um, worst performers of 2022 are more or less so far the best performers of 23. But the, the breadth has been pretty impressive. I mean, really, most things are up. Um, I do think some of this is expected in January where you might have had some tax loss selling. Uh, in December that gets unwound in January. Uh, in other words, there's a wash sale rule that forces you to not buy back what you sold for a tax loss for 30 days. And a lot of those 30 day periods are expiring or have been expiring, which may theoretically be creating some, some upside buying for some of the losers of last year. But we'll, you will continue watching the, the general themes within market activity. It's a little too early and a little too sporadic so far to speak with a lot more conviction. Um, but as far as a longer term period that wasn't very sporadic, the dividend payers in the S&P 500, that's different than the dividend growers that we might be buying. But of course, if you are going to be a dividend grower, you have to be a dividend payer. And so the, but just because you're a dividend payer doesn't make you a dividend grower, right? Our portfolio has at any given time, 30 to 35 stocks. The S and P is obviously 500 stocks, but the dividend payers in the S and P outperformed the dividend non payers by 23% last year, pretty staggering number. Um, dividends paid in the S and P last year though, were $563 billion. It's the highest amount of dividend payments in history. Um, I want to remind people that in the 2010s, the decade we just came out of, dividends were only 26% of the return of the market. And um, in the 1990s, it was a very low number like that as well. But in the 2000s, so the decade in between, dividends were over 100% of the total return because 
the price appreciation was negative. Um, and if you just go back from the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 50 years, more normal decades, no negative decades in there, um, dividends on the low end were about 40% of the market return, on the high end, about 75%, and averaging somewhere in there, um, roughly you know half of market return. That was a 50-year average before these last couple of decades. That historical context I provide just because I don't ever want to get away from it. And uh, I think there's a lot of relevance there around our dividend orientation. The current payout ratio of the S&P 500 is only 33%, meaning of total S&P profits, only 33% are being paid out in the form of dividends. Um, it has averaged about 48% for 100 years. And uh, that peak level we have not gotten back to since the financial crisis. So finding companies that are paying at their historical payout rate or above it um, that have not settled into a far reduced level of dividend payout, uh, that obviously uh, requires selectivity right now. You're not getting it from the index. Switching gears to bonds and inflation right now, I want to point out that the break even implied for inflation in the TIPS market, the Treasury Inflation Protected Securities, it was over 3% annualized in April of last year, and it's currently down to right about 2%, technically 2.1%. So those tip spreads have come in quite a bit, implying much lower break-even assumption for inflation. Uh, the 10-year bond yield today, by the way, closed at 3.52%. Um, the top performing sector for the day today was technology at plus 2.28. The bottom performing was energy, which was negative 0.2. It was the only sector down. It was barely down. Um, by the way, the five-year break-even had been at 3.6%, and um, it's now down to 2.1%. So you've just had a dramatic um, reduction in implied inflation levels uh, embodied in the, in the tip spreads that we look to quite heavily. Okay, uh, so just by way of news, I think most people heard over the weekend, the White House Chief of Staff, Ron Klain, will be leaving his post in the next couple of weeks, and it appears that Jeff Zients is set to be named the replacement. Um, he's got a, a extensive resume, has covered a lot of ground, more recently worked in the White House in COVID policy implementation. So that aforementioned um, debt ceiling drama, I think you are at about six months out uh, till anything is potentially resolved, uh, maybe longer, um, August, September, uh, no earlier than July is very much the uh, likely scenario. Um, so on the way, just expect uh, a lot of a lot of dumb things to be said and to be done. Um, look, President Biden's opinion right now, from a political calculus standpoint, is that he um, can wait till the very last minute, and then it will be much more uh, pressure on the Republicans at that point. And I, I don't disagree that that's probably the lay of the land politically. The question mark is whether or not the Republicans will pass a budget that does raise the debt ceiling. Because if they do that, where they go get some of the changes that they want in a budgetary sense, but still allow for a debt increase, then it changes the narrative. It, it, uh, it, it sort of implies it's the other side now not raising the debt limit. And I'm not sure um, if the Republicans can or will do that. Uh, it was done by Speaker Boehner in 2011, and it changed the leverage in that debate. Um, but I don't know if the Republicans can or will. And then if they do, I don't obviously know exactly what the Democrats would do about it. I can't even imagine that the Senate would approve any budget that the House um, Republicans approve. And yet um, we'll, there's a lot that will shake out between now and then. Um, what else do we want to go through? I think eventually whatever deal happens, that they'll end up getting a cap on future discretionary spending increases. And that will be some form of a political victory and perhaps a, a small level, a substantive victory. But I don't think it's the real essence of what's happening on the budget side, which is much more uh, driven by entitlement spending. Speaking of which, I do actually think that'll happen too, that they'll get a commission on entitlement spending embedded into the eventual budget bill um, that's one of the demands that many on the in the Republican House have. Uh, in terms of economic news, the um, National Association of Business Economics released its 2023 
business conditions survey this morning, there are more companies expecting net layoffs in the survey than that are expecting net hiring. That's not good. Um, but there's definitely been a significant improvement in sentiment about inflation with almost every company surveyed, not quite um, all, but nearly all, indicating that uh, material costs have declined for them. Um, I would point out uh, separately, just from a, a Bloomberg chart update, that weekly bankruptcies have picked up. Uh, now they're not they're not high they're higher um, but they're still not you know quite um, uh, where they have averaged for the last 15 years or so when you exclude recessions but they're getting pretty close. Okay, so uh, again, yeah, the big housing dividend cafe on Friday. The only kind of anecdotal news I'll share since then is that existing home sales declined one and a half percent in December. So that brought total sales down year over year, uh, transaction volume down 34%. And that was with an uh, elevated amount of sales in January, February, March. So that, that trend of declining volume, we're now down to the lowest level of activity we've seen in over a decade. Um, the Fed is definitely telegraphing quite heavily quarter point rate hike at the next meeting and perhaps a quarter point rate hike behind that. Um, the vice chair of the Fed, Lel Brainerd, made a speech at the University of Chicago over the weekend indicating this. So um, that is my expectation. The other piece I want to point out is that the, the Treasury Department may be doing things right now to sort of hold on and deploy cash, which enables them to kind of make some of their debt allowances last longer with this current uh, debt ceiling hiccup. And I, I think that does play in to the Fed's plans of quantitative tightening. It, it uh, handcuffs their ability to accelerate removing cash from the system. Um, oil was up a dollar since the Thursday close, kind of flat today. Uh, a takeaway from Davos was that Saudi Arabia is definitely uh, making noise about more openness to denominating uh, oil sales outside of U.S. dollar. And uh, China in particular, in particular continues to express a desire for uh, yuan-based uh, purchase of Saudi oil. You must read the Against Doomsdayism section uh, in the DC Today, and uh, certainly the question I thought was worthwhile it, and ask David. Uh, I'm going to leave it there. Brian will bring you DC Today tomorrow. Um, we're looking for the PCE index this week, the personal consumption indicators, another inflation uh, uh, price measurement, the, this one that the Fed looks at heavily. That's on store for the week. Earnings season is now in full effect. We'll get a lot more information about earnings in the week to come. And that is what we have for you today in the DC Today. Thank you for listening, watching, and reading. And reach out with any questions, anytime. Questions at thebonsongroup.com. Thanks for listening to DC Today.